from Charlemagne to the Doctrine of the Two Swords. Now this is a time period with Charlemagne from 747 AD to the Doctrine of the Two Swords ending in 1303 AD. Now Charlemagne <coughs> we see from 747 to 814 and he had basically united most of the Western Europe uh, he had been recognized by the Pope as this was understood to have granted him divine legitimacy you know, at the very bones of St. Peter and Paul Charlemagne was crowned and anointed by the Pope as Augustus as Romans recognized him as having been crowned by God Charlemagne was recognized as the protector of the faith and this caused a very intimate relationship to form between future kings and future popes. Also the fact that Charlemagne had protected the Pope and cared for his injuries in a time of distress caused an even greater bond between the Pope and the Emperor. Constantine had issues with the Pope crowning uh, Constantinople I should say had issues with the Pope crowning Charlemagne to the position of Augustus. Now Constant Constantine had previously governed from Constantinople and it was understood to be a center of government authority for the East especially. You know what we see here is we, we see sort of like a, a situation where by the Pope crowning Charlemagne that the East with uh, Constantinople you know they may have felt like like they were being places like an outsider because Constantinople had historically been the great seat of authority uh, after Constantine had moved the, the position of authority or the, the, the most central location of authority from Rome to Constantinople. And one of the things that we see here is the donation of Constantine, an 8th century document. The donation of Constantine was a forged document that was understood in the Middle Ages to be authentic. Now this gave authority of the empire to the Pope and this is something that um, uh, was used by a Pope and it was used uh, basically uh, in, in, a, in an appropriate way but it entitled the Patriarchs of Jerusalem, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and even other bishops in the world to be subject to the Pope and his successors. Now this document was, was very bad because this is something that it's almost like having a illegal title to a house or something like that that people made up. I mean it, it's that kind of a that's that kind of a document. And Pope Leo IX from 1002 to 1054 uh, he was a ruler in both central Italy as well as being a pope and it was he that had cited the donation of Constantine in a letter to the Patriarch of Constantinople as this resulted in the Great Schism. The Pope had assured the Patriarch of Constantinople that the donation of Constantine was indeed authentic as the Pope of Rome was a successor of Peter and thus, and thus he had the right uh, to the church basically now, this is this is not this is definitely not good 
Now, the Great Schism happened in 1054. And this occurred as a schism of Eastern Greek speaking and Western Latin speaking Christianity through both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church as communicating one another whereas before this had happened both churches uh, comprised the same universal church. Since the Eastern Orthodox claimed the Byzantine Empire to have been an empire run by the emperor with supreme authority over the church and state, they did not recognize the papal authority of Pope Leo IX to be an authority over the four eastern patriarchs. They especially did not recognize the uh, Philoque clause added to the Nicene Creed in 1014. Now, if you study the Great Schism, you'll find that you know, this is the story I'm telling you is not the only aspect of it. Uh, this is something that there are numerous differences between Latin speaking people and Greek speaking people that existed for many years, uh, even before Christ. And those differences were very cultural and they had a lot to do with uh, a lot of prior history and, and it was really the case that the differences between the, the Greeks and the Romans and their cultures uh, I believe really had a significant influence in the Great Schism. Uh, it may have been the case that that Roman speaking, or I should say that Latin speaking people and Greek speaking people may not have always liked each other because of, of some differences in history and, and some cultural differences and stuff. Now, Pope Gregory the seventh. Now he was declared. Uh, he basically used the term uh, pope to be exclusive to the bishop of Rome. Now, whereas the term had previously been applied to bishops, especially senior bishops in the East, so it's it's Pope Gregory the seventh here that he's using the term pope exclusively for, for the successors of Peter, him and, and future successors of Peter, who would turn out to be. Now he had a dispute with the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV as the Pope confirmed a new canon law that governed elections of new popes through the College of Cardinals because a dispute occurred between Henry IV and the Pope about who would elect clergy. This was known as the investiture controversy. The Pope had excommunicated Henry three times as Henry had appointed antipope Clement III as this opposed Pope Gregory VII. The Pope went so far as to support a rival climate as emperor, Clement as emperor. And the Synod of Brixen disposed Pope Gregory VII and elected Antipope Clement III as Pope. Now that Synod, you know, we would obviously not consider canonical uh, because this is something that the Emperor had obviously done. I mean, this is, it's really the case that uh, and what we see is we see a dispute between Pope and Emperor and the Pope's trying to elect a new or the uh, Pope is trying to basically put in a new Emperor and the Emperor is trying to put in a new Pope so you know this is this is uh, about as bad as it can get right here uh, with uh, issue between church and state and you know if we look at this too 
this is something that's happening after the Great Schism. I mean, this is this is really the case that uh, we're seeing uh, almost like a breakdown occurring here in the West you know, with, with this this uh, incident. And Anna Pope Clement the Third, you know, he stood against Pope Gregory the Seventh, Victor the Third, uh, Urban the Second, and Paschal the Second until he died. He was the most significant leader against the Gregarian reforms. Uh, pope Gregory had canonized was canonized as Pope and not Anna Pope Clement III. You know what's interesting here is we see Anna Pope Clement III having lived throughout all these different popes but yet you know when, when he died when Anna Pope Clement III died it was not him that was considered Pope it was it was all this whole succession of of uh, canonical popes. That's, I think that's really interesting because you know when these canonic what are now canonical popes when when they uh, were alive, you know, they may have had some doubt in their mind. I hate to say this, but maybe they had some doubt in their mind as to how this was all going to turn out. Uh, but yet. It, um, it turned out that, that all these people were indeed canonical popes. Now with Pope Urban II, he instituted the First Crusade as an attempt to take the Holy Lands back from Islam. He instituted the Roman court as it provided a royal court that kings could appeal to and that the Pope could work through in order to promote the interests of the church. He promoted the policies of Pope uh, Gregory VII. And here you know, we see a very, very formal introduction of the, uh, the Roman court as like a legal jurisdiction that popes had or a legal court that popes had. You know, King William II he had nominated Ems, uh, Anselm of, as Archbishop of Canterbury after the king had left the position open for many years. However, this was done because the king had an illness and was concerned that he was going to die. During the time that the king left the position of Archbishop open, he had kept the money that would have otherwise been appropriated to the Archbishop. Since Anselm was a supporter of Gregorian reforms that favored the independence of the clergy, King William hated Anselm more and more every day and since the the clergy of Britain depended upon the king for financial support they could not support Anselm either. The king tried to get St. Anselm to yield by calling the council at Rockingham but St. Anselm uh, remained firm and appealed to the Pope, which would be Pope Urban II. Since, since Pope Urban II had just undergone a major issue uh, with the investiture controversy with uh, Emperor Henry IV, he made an agreement with King William II that the King would recognize the Pope and that the Pope would sanction the uh, ecclesiastical status quo. St. Anselm thus was in exile and uh, King William II 
was able to keep the Archbishop's revenue until the king had died. Uh, what we see here is we see a situation where King William II, an English king, is uh, in a si or a king of England, I should say, is in a situation where he didn't really want uh, Anselm as Archbishop of Canterbury. In fact, you know, he he tried to avoid that. But he knew he was going to die, so he elected him, or he thought he was going to die, so he elected him as Archbishop, or put him in office, I should say, which would be a better term. But then, you know, apparently uh, King William II didn't die, and so Anselm lived, and you know, there was this whole issue of the investiture controversy there, and... Uh, you know, King William II um, uh, made it hard for Anselm. Anselm had to leave, and um, uh, Anselm you know, eventually would come back later on after uh, King William, you know, after things had had um, had, had gotten better because King William II. basically dying. And uh, here we have the uh, uh, Charter of Liberties. You know, when King Henry I took the throne, the Charter of Liberties had been issued to bind the king to uh, regulations concerning the treatment of individuals, church officials, and nobles. The nobility had addressed abuses of royal power by William II that addressed issues with vacant seas over taxation of barons, uh, pluralism, and simony. Now, these were big issues back then. They still should be today uh, things that, that need to be watched for and stuff. But uh, you know, this is this is something to really be concerned about. Uh, these kind of issues, and I can see why. The Charter of Liberty would thus be necessary. Uh, when we look at um, uh, Anselm of Canterbury specifically, we see that Anselm of Canterbury, when he was a child, he had a vision that involved him having been called by God to the court of God. Anselm had thus climbed the local mountain to the summit and he noticed some of the king's workers being slothful. Nevertheless, Anselm entered the court of God, and he only saw the king with only his cupbearer, and the assumption was that the king had sent his household out to gather the harvest. Anselm, being called by the master, sat at his feet, and after the king uh, questioned him about what he was seeking and who he was, the king commanded his cupbearer to give Anselm some bread to eat as Anselm feasted on the bread of heaven. Now when we look at uh, King Henry the first here, we see the investor, investor controversy. Now, traditionally, the king had invested the new pope, but Pope Ur Urban II condemned the practice in 1099. When St. Anselm uh, heard Pope Urban II's decree, uh, he had returned from exile. King Henry I believed in church reform as he ruled over both England and Normandy. Anselm went back into exile, and Henry confiscated both the estates and the revenues of Anselm. After St. Anselm had uh, threatened excommunication, a solution was found that caused the king to forfeit the right of the king to invest in clergy. While the clergy would be responsible for the homage of properties, temporalities, basically, in England. 
a distinction was made between secular and ecclesiastical power. This gave rise to the 1107 Concord of London, or uh, Concurbat, I should say, Concurbat of London, and the 1122 Concurbat of uh, Worms, I believe it's pronounced, not Worms. The Concurbat of Worms, 1122. It uh, eliminated the vestiture controversy of clergy by lay leaders altogether, but it had also given leaders some significant influence to unofficially appoint clergy. Now this is important right here that it gave some unofficial uh, influence to appoint clergy. So you know like the secular leaders, kings and stuff, they still had an ability to appoint clergy but it wasn't like necessarily an official ability to appoint clergy. And here we see the first uh, Lateran Council of 1123. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the first council confirmed the Concurbat of Worms as it had been signed by, Holman, by Holy Roman Emperor Henry V. King of Germany and Pope Callistus II, as all bishops, abbots, and higher clergy would be elected by ecclesiastical authorities, exclusively with the emperor only having the right of approval in Germany. The council was understood by the church to have eliminated the lay investiture controversy that had existed between the church and state. The first Latern uh, Council agreed that the German king had the right to invest bishops in secular authority, while the church reserved the right to invest bishops in sacred authority, whereas before Holy Roman Emperors had believed that they had a right granted by God to name clergy and even in times of need popes within their realm. And then we see the second Lateran Council of 1139. Well, since Pope Honorius II had died, Anacletus II, Anacletus II had been elected Pope by both the support of Roman citizens and the majority of cardinals. But this happened on the same day that Pope Innocent II had been elected by a majority a few hours prior through cardinals that had been, that had declared that the election would happen uh, through eight men. A council was held in Pisa under Pope Innocent II that confirmed his position of authority and condemned uh, Anacletus II. Pope Innocent II excommunicated King Roger II of Sicily and disposed everything instituted by Anacletus II and all those that had been ordained by him over the years that he had uh, that uh, over the years that he had been considered Pope. Anacletus II had so many powerful supporters in government positions and such that Pope Innocent II had to flee to the Alps for many years while Anacletus ruled, and Anacletus had died before the Second Lateran Council had ended under Pope Innocent II. Now this is this is really interesting here uh, because. Now what this is showing is it's showing a situation where you had um, a pope that was considered legitimate that actually had to flee because uh, there was somebody else that um, that took the office and had support of government officials and you know when the when the pope came back. And, and took the throne, so to speak, it, it caused um, 
it caused the, the, the antipope, so to speak, that was ruling to be rejected. And so, you know, when we look at this, I mean, it, it really raises some interesting questions. Then there's a third Lateran Council, 11th, 1179. Since Pope Hadrian IV had died, cardinals had elected two different popes, as one was Alexander III and the other was called Victor IV. Since Victor IV was supported by Emperor Frederick I, even though fewer cardinals had been uh, had been in support of Victor IV, it took the Peace of Venice to bring the conflict to an end. Unfortunately, before the Peace of Venice, Victor IV had died, such that two more antipopes had been elected after Victor IV. After the Peace of Venice, the Third Lateran Council was called by Pope Alexander III. Now, you know, this right here is showing even more issues with, uh, you know, people that, with, with the apostolic succession of popes starting to diverge, uh, so to speak, and uh, it, it takes some efforts here to, to get, uh, to reject the, the guys that, that aren't considered legitimate and to ensure that uh, uh, the, the canonical people are, are recognized as being in office uh, for the office they have. And then there's Pope Innocent III. Now, Pope Innocent III claimed supremacy over all European kings, organized the Fourth Crusade, finalized the schism between Orthodoxy and Catholicism and required that all uh, clergy under him pay a tax of their wages toward the Crusades. Now, the Great Schism had gone on for a long time before this, but it was really the case that people would have hoped that the Great Schism could be healed, or that it, it could be, uh, uh, that, that both churches would enter into communion with one another again. But when the Fourth Crusade happened, it, it caused soldiers that represented the Pope, basically, to uh, nail Constantinople, the seat of the Eastern Power, seat of Eastern Power, and as a result of this, it, it caused uh, the, the people in the East not to think much of the people in the West, and, and it caused the, the, the Great Schism to to be a issue possibly for all time hopefully not but possibly uh, possibly for all time and then we got the fourth Lateran Council and uh, this is a council where Pope Innocent III used the phrase ex cathedra to make decrees from the chair of St. Peter and he thus claimed that outside of the Catholic Church that there is no salvation. You know, this very idea that from the chair of St. Peter that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church got repeated by Pope Boniface the Eighth, Pope Clement the Fifth, Pope Eugene the Fourth. Pope Leo X, Pope Pius IX, Pope Benedict the um, 14th, and Pope Pius IX. Uh, 
Now we look at um, Archbishop of Canterbury Stephen Langton from 1207 to 1228. Now King John and Pope Innocent III had disputed Langton being Archbishop. The dispute resulted in King John having to accept Langton as Archbishop and also having to sign the Magna Carta of 1215. Now this uh, this was something that had a precedent in the 1100 uh, Charter of Liberties. The problem was that after Archbishop Hubert Walter had died, some monks elected uh, Reynold, I believe his name is pronounced as Archbishop, while others under pressure from King John had elected John de Grey. The Pope chose Langton as Archbishop and it caused King John to claim anyone that recognized Langton as Archbishop to be a public enemy. Also, the Pope ordered Philip II of France to dispose of King John on account of the issue. Ste Stephen, I believe it's pronounced, focused uh, or forced King John to renew the Charter of Liberties of King Henry I as this resulted in the signing of Magna Carta. Now, now here we see a Pope uh, actually ordering a king to dispose of another king because of uh, this sort of investiture issue. And uh, you know, it's, it's really it's really kind of sad when you think about it, but uh, you know, this is this is what was going on, and lastly here we've got the doctrine of the two swords that emerges. Now this is something that it emerged during the time of Pope Boniface here, the eighth, but. The doctrine of the two swords is something that would continue on for a long time afterward. Now, this is a, a, a something that that this is something that I'm sure still today is uh, is an important doctrine, and. The church basically has two swords under its control in this doctrine, as one is the temporal and the other is the spiritual. While the spiritual is wielded by the church, the temporal is wielded on behalf of the church. One sword is in the hands of priests, while the other is in the hands of kings and also soldiers, but at the wish and permission of priests. According to the doctrine, the temporal authority is to be subject to the spiritual authority. Now, when we look at the doctrine of the swords, the temporal authority being subject to the spiritual authority, it follows along very nicely with St. Augustine's Tale of the Two Cities in the City of God. You know, this is something that um, uh, it, it is strictly uh, seemingly correct doctrine. But one of the problems we get into with this kind of doctrine is that it raises a lot of questions regarding the kings and their right to rule uh, sovereign sovereignly because in the new testament when the faith was was still new and before the the conquest of, of milvian bridge the new testament it recorded that people were to be subject to the kings or people were to be subject to those in authority uh, you know the scripture even makes clear that uh, everybody in authority has been is in authority because God put them in authority 
but when we see the doctrine of the two swords and also the idea of the two kingdoms the idea of everything being under the control of the uh, spiritual authority uh, which ideally it should be is uh, becomes a big issue because when a uh, successor of Peter or some other church official believes that they have authority invested in, in, in them from God to represent the spiritual interest over the state then it can leave little room for the state to uh, make decisions on by themselves without being sort of like a puppet of the uh, church and so it, it, there's this agency issue that I'm going to just hear. and this is something that becomes an issue because the state needs to have the authority in many cases to make their own decisions to err and, and to be able to uh, continue on without being disposed, without having popes dispose of them and stuff like that for seemingly little offenses. Uh, I mean, seemingly little offenses to, to people that may not believe. Um, it, 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 it can cause some problems that would be unforeseen. And, and that's sort of the point here that, that we're going to get to. And here's some references for you.